liberalism has failed because liberalism has succeeded. What will follow liberalism, it seems to me, is one of the great questions that is uh, uh, animating this conference. Is liberalism sustainable, or does it in some ways provoke the crisis internal to itself that demands something else, that demands the consideration of a different way of conceiving of ourselves? Part of my argument, then, is that what we see today as a response that we call populism is in many ways uh, an effort to reassert a sense of control. I connected this movement to a longer tradition that predates the rise of the liberal tradition, arguing that in many ways that there's the possibility of a more communitarian, a more relational, perhaps a more democratic and egalitarian post-liberal possibility. <music>
It would be nice, though, if any of this actually worked. Unfortunately, what sounds great in theory does not always yield the best results when implemented in practice, in the real world. Are you freer as BlackRock uproots more communities, gutting the American dream in exchange for profit? Are you freer as railroad companies are able to poison an entire town, only to be defended by right liberal politicians in the name of the free market and opposition to big government socialism? Remember, whenever the government does anything, it's socialism. Are you freer because you can order something on Amazon and have it show up to your doorstep a day later? How about the Amazon employees forced to urinate in bottles while driving the delivery vehicles so as to ensure you get your air fryer within 36 hours? Are they reveling in the blessings of liberty? Does it matter to you so long as you receive the air fryer in time? Are you freer as you are called a bigot and a fascist for following your faith in a world increasingly hostile to God? Are you freer as unelected bureaucrats gloat that public schools own your children? Are you freer as those same unelected bureaucrats threaten to take your children away from you if your child falls prey to predatory, progressive ideology? Are you freer when your employer makes it easier for you to kill your unborn child in the name of empowerment, and certainly never in the name of profitability, than to take parental leave? The ends of the right liberal and the left liberal alike do little to free man and instead debase and enslave him. The average American is a slave to both his passions, sex, pornography, food, drugs, this is freedom to the left liberal, and to an oppressive collection of corporate interests that see people as mere economic units. This is freedom to the right liberal. Both the right liberal and the left liberal purportedly champion free speech, explaining that open debate and discussion will allow man to pursue truth. Indeed, the United States Supreme Court has offered this justification for decades. If First Amendment jurisprudence tells us anything, however, it is that the marketplace of ideas does not exist to actually aid man in his quest for truth and instead, under the liberal order, is a good in itself. Instead of engaging in open discussion to unearth the truth, the liberal citizen is permitted only to debate and discuss ad infinitum. He is encouraged to forever window shop at the marketplace of ideas so long as he never makes a purchase. The mere act of debate and discussion, rather than the pursuit of truth, has become the aim of the liberal's free speech. You can debate and discuss until the end of time, but do not dare to actually commit to a position unless that position is, endless debate and discussion is a good in and of itself. Liberalism's prohibition on committing to truth to any competing worldview demonstrates its subtle, insidiously coercive nature. Liberalism pretends to neutrality, valuing pluralism and discussion, but it does not and cannot tolerate any questioning of its ascendance. Any attempts to question liberalism are shouted down as threats to democracy, which of course actually means threats to liberalism. An iron fist is still an iron fist, even if encased within a velvet glove. The social and anthropological assumptions of liberalism color the worldview of most Americans today. We are naturally free, and we've entered into society by way of a social contract in order to preserve ourselves against the nasty, brutish nature of our fellow man. But is that true? Standing in opposition to the right liberals and the left liberals are the post-liberals. As the label might suggest, post-liberals understand that remedies to man's present predicaments cannot be found within the Enlightenment's liberal framework, as the prescriptions of neither the right liberals nor the left liberals offer tenable solutions and rather only continue to enslave man both externally to powerful interests that do not care for him and internally to his passions, whims, and appetites. The post-liberals understand that blind faith in allegedly organic market functions and ever-increasing social license serve only to further atomize man from home and community, de-emphasize inherent human dignity in both the womb and in the workplace, and undergird a tyrannical philosophical order that pretends to neutrality while demanding total obedience. In contrast to their liberal counterparts, post-liberals challenge the dogma that individuals are purely self-interested and rational actors, and thus emphasize the role of communities, traditions, and social bonds in shaping society as well as human behavior and well-being. Post-liberals reject the fiction of a purely neutral state, instead suggesting that the state should play an active role in promoting the common good and ensuring social cohesion. 
Post liberals understand that unfettered markets, the product of economic liberalism, result in inequality and exploitation, believing that the market should be oriented to the good, emphasizing pro worker, pro family initiatives. In other words, post liberals believe that the state and the market exist to improve society, not just in theory, but in practice. The only way out is through. We can move beyond liberalism, we can all be post liberals if only we have the courage and the imagination. And there you have it, a very brief introduction to post-liberalism and to the American post-liberal publication. If you like this, or hated this and want to learn more, I suggest you check out the American post-liberal and post-liberal order. I can't say too much just yet, but the American post-liberal has some very exciting guest pieces dropping in the not-so-distant future, and its podcast looks to be a good time too. Stay tuned.